speaker of today, the French novelist, essayist and philosopher Pascal Bruckner, among many other uh, interesting works on politics, uh, social and philosophical issues, um, Bruckner is the author of Lune de Fiel, adapted to the film Petre Moon by Roman Polanski, and Les Voleurs de Beauté, for which he received the Prix Renaudot in 1997. Uh, among essays, Le Sanglot de l'Homme Blanc, The Tears of the White Man, is considered to be the most influential and also controversial work of Pascal Bruckner. Most recently, Bruckner wrote on, on the West's continual self-criticism, La Tyrannie de la Pénitence, on the culture of the endless hedonism, and that is what he's going to talk about today as well. His most recent book is Le Mariage de l'Amour a il échoué, and the title speaks for itself, but unfortunately it's not yet translated in Dutch, but maybe it's... You have so. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Bruckner, it's a great honor to have you among us here, because you wrote the book on the uh, happiness mania, the perfect pétuel, essay sur le devoir de bonheur, translated in Dutch as Geesel het gelukkig zijn. Mr. Bruckner. Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen and excuse me to read my text because English not being my mother tongue I have to have a written text as a support but I will try to improvise to give questions. So uh, happiness in the Western societies is the oldest and the newest idea. Since antiquity happiness has been nothing but the history of its contradictory and successive meanings. In his time, St. Augustine, who is one of the founders of Christianity, already counted no less than 289 differing opinions on the subject. The 18th century devoted almost 50 treatises to the subject of happiness and today there is no week, no month without a book being published in English, in Dutch, in French or in Italian about the subject of happiness. From the very start, Christianity, loyal to its Greek inspiration, recognized the aspiration to happiness. But it put happiness beyond man's reach in Eden or in heaven. And we hope to be happy one day in the future in heaven alongside with God and his saints. Happiness existed yesterday or will exist tomorrow in nostalgia or in hope, but it never exists today. It would be madness for the Christians to try to accomplish it in this world. As a fallen creature, man must first redeem the sin of existing. He must work on his salvation. And salvation is all the more anguishing because it is gained or lost once and for all. There are no second chances in contrast to Hindus or Buddhists who are caught up in the cycle of reincarnations until they finally gain deliverance. For the Western society, the dice roll only once. We have one life, we succeed or we fail, but it's only a one time. It is typical of Christianity to have over-dramatized our existence by subjecting it to the alternative between hell and paradise. Terrible disproportion. A tiny human error can lead to eternal punishment, but inversely all our sufferings can find their reward in the beyond if we have led life pleasing to God. Paradise is a structure like a school. You succeed, you succeed your exam, or you miss it. What importance can little happiness of life have 
in fact, known. They are not only ephemeral and deceptive, but also draw us away from the true path. They throw us into a lamentable enslavement to earthly good. Fortunately, to release the terrible tension between paradise and hell, which provoked the great fears of the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church has the excellent idea in the 12th century to invent the purgatory. This enormous waiting room, a third position located between heaven and hell, that allowed those who live, whose lives had been mediocre, neither completely good or completely bad, to erase the debt to God. So thanks to purgatory, life on earth becomes sweeter, more lovable. The idea of, of the irreversible fades. A sin, limited in time, ceases to entail an infinite loss. Expiation remains possible and salvation, salvation loses the inhumanity given it by dogma. The Reformation itself, despite its doctrinal intransigence, intransigence has a paradoxical effect to, rehabil to rehabilitate life on earth by its effort to incarnate the values of the other world, the here and now. Little by little, during the 17th and 18th century, the discovery of pain relieving drugs, the use of anesthetics, the discovery of laudanum, which was a kind of morphine, the refinement of aspirin, have swept away the priest's fabrication regarding pain as a divine, necessary punishment. The theme of happiness comes from Christianity, but it flourished against it in the next centuries. The modern conception of happiness was first formulated, at least to my knowledge, by Voltaire in his poem Le Monde, which was published in 1736. <coughs> the earthly paradise is where I am. The Enlightenment and the French Revolution not only proclaimed the erasure of original sin, but entered into history as a promise of happiness addressed to humanity as a whole. Happiness is no longer a metaphysical chimera, an implausible goal to be sought by means of all the complex mysteries of salvation. It is here and now, it is now or never. Everywhere in Europe, people were becoming convinced that it was reasonable to hope for the establishment of well-being on Earth. This reflected a marvelous confidence in man's perfectibility, in his ability to free himself from eternal brooding on unhappiness, and in his will to create something new that is something better. Western societies dare to rebel against their own traditions by responding to pain not with the consolation of the beyond, but with the improvement of this world. An act of unprecedented audacity that the American Declaration of Independence has not to include in its article by asserting, as I just said, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable human rights, and I think that the right to happiness has also been inscribed into um, the European Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. The idea of progress supplants that of eternity, and the future becomes a refuge of hope, the place where man should be, or will be, one day, reconciled with himself. Proclaimed as a right by all the progressive movements during the 19th and 20th centuries, century, happiness slowly turns 
to become a duty after the 60s. Capitalism has ceased to be a system of production based on slaving and labor and sweat and tears and becomes a system of consumption that assumes that assume expenditure and waste. A new strategy which includes pleasure instead of excluding it does away with an antagonism between the economic machine and our drive and makes the later the engine of development. We have to consume in order to be happy. But above all, the Western individual has extricated himself from the straitjacket of the collectivity and he has acquired full autonomy. Now that he is free, he no longer has a choice. Since the obstacles of the road to Eden have vanished, he is condemned to be happy, or to put it in another way, he has only himself to blame. We derive from happiness as a right to happiness as an imperative. Become your own best friend, acquire self-esteem, think positively, dare to live in harmony, etc. The multitude of books on the subject suggests that it is not so easy. Happiness not only constitutes, along with the market and spirituality, the biggest industry in our age, it is also, and very precisely, the new moral order. And that is why depression is spreading as a rebellion against this new commandment. The obsession of health tends to medicalize every moment in life instead of allowing us to live in easy insouciance. The therapeutic domain annexes everything that previously belonged to the order of savoir vivre. Collective rituals and pleasures are converted into anxieties, evaluated in terms of their utility or their, or their harmfulness. What matters more, most is no longer living to the full time that is granted us, but extend it as much as possible. The notion of the stages of life has been replaced by that of longevity. Duration becomes a canonical value, even if it has to be won, at the price of terrible restriction. Making time which used to mean reserving a few moments for one's own ends is now associated with an unremitting productivityism, a maniacal accumulation of additional years of life. By trying to eliminate every kind of anomaly, every kind of weakness, we end up denying the principal virtue of health, a lack of concern about oneself. Only a sick person can think that health is happiness. For someone who is not sick, Health is just a fact and nothing more. more. I'm in a good health and uh, that doesn't make me happy. To make health the equivalent of felicity is to imply that we are all morons without knowing it and that we need to be made aware of our condition. We always have to save ourselves from something. High blood pressure. pressure imperfect digestion, a tendency to gain, to gain weight. We are never thin, we are never thin enough, muscular enough, tanned enough, and we have to redeem ourselves from those faults. The therapeutic ideal has become an obsession that accompanies us everywhere and that the media and those around us never let us forget. A strange, an obstinate self-examination and self-castigation makes the body a sign of a latent mass. And since being in a good shape is a sign of election, letting yourself go becomes, inversely, a synonym of decline or being ready for the scrap heap. Whence the frequent comparison of our fitness clubs and the machines with medieval instruments of torture, except that in our case we are all voluntary victims 
and bodybuilding illustrates the dream of redesigning one's own anatomy, of being one's own creator. Since sickness and recovery are becoming less and less distinct, at the risk of creating a society of hypochondriacs and permanently dysfunctional persons, the only crime we can commit against it, it, it is not to think about it night and day. From childhood on, we are required to redeem our imperfections to reshape ourselves from head to toe. This work done on ourselves, the incessant inspection, even if it has to do with matters as futile as standing or losing weight in preparation for vacation on the beach, is the equivalent of a moral redemption. Our professors of well-being, whether clerics, coaches, Psychologists, psychologists, philosophers or physicians are kind inquisitors who manage to dry up our main source of joy, detachment, insouciance, and awareness of little everyday problems. How can we know whether we are happy? Who sets the norm? Why do we have to be happy? And what was what shall we reply to those who pathetically confess, I can't do it? The problem of happiness is that it is abstract, it has no precise and specific content, and uh, everyone has its own way to be happy, which doesn't fit with someone else's uh, conception of happiness. And that's precisely the main issue. First paradox, the society that proclaims happiness gradually becomes a society haunted by distress, pursued by the fear of death, by the fear of illness or aging, refusing everything that could be negative. The more we try to eradicate suffering, the more it proliferates and multiplies. In the 19th and 20th century, the main disease, the main psychological disease, was neurosis. Nowadays, the main psychological disease is no more neurosis, at least in our society. It's depression. And what is depression? It's uh, the illness which occurs when uh, our, uh, our own ideal is so high that we cannot perform it and uh, we fall apart because we're supposed to be permanently success successful and happy and in good health and sometimes we just say I cannot do that anymore and then we, um, we collapse, it's a kind of inner collapse of the individual. So unhappiness is not only unhappiness, it is worse yet the failure to be happy. And at least in the Christian religion, suffering, constituting the norm, kept a meaning by bringing us closer to God. It was an opportunity to make progress. In, in a secular society like ours, the, the problem I mean, uh, comes from the fact that we do not accept classical limitation to human conditions because modern societies have rebelled against those conditions, these conditions. Hence our, our problem and our contradiction. Second paradox, as long as it remained it remain a superb article of faith, happiness could fire our imagination, remain as a vanishing point for a desire that remained alive and voracious. Now that it has become the only horizon of our democratic societies, being connected with work, will and effort, it is necessarily a source of anguish, 
My happiness makes me anxious. Our happiness worries us and poisons our lives with all sorts of demands that are impossible to meet. Happiness is supposed to be just a matter of will. Contentment is within your reach. All you have to do is undergo a positive conditioning, an ethical discipline that will lead you to eat. To eat sorry. And most often by a cruel misunderstanding, we move farther away from contentment by the same means that was supposed to allow us to approach it. We cannot order happiness as we order a meal in a restaurant. We cannot whistle on happiness as we whistle on a dog so that it can co come sitting on our feet. Our societies put into the category of the pathological what other culture, cultures consider normal, the preponderance of pain. And our society is put into the category of the normal and even the necessary, what others see as exceptional, the feeling of self-fulfillment. The question is not whether we are less or more happy than our ancestors. Our conception of it has changed, and to change utopias is to change constraints. But we are probably living in the world's first society, that make people unhappy not to be happy. Thank you very much. Tout à fait un peu, un peu bizarre, on ne parle pas de français ce soir. Mais, mais, comme vous savez, le monde est globalisé, donc tout le monde parle anglais. Et, et même si surtout en France, oui. <laughs> so, um, I was asked to um, ask you a few questions. Uh, which I accepted <laughs> and um, I'll just prepare a few lines and then I have two questions in mind, well actually three, but one is split up in two, so um, here I go. Um, well, thank you of course for your uh, informative sketch of, let's say, some notable points of Western thinking on, on happiness and what, what strikes me uh, is what I would say the most um, fundamental line of thought, which is to me that the, um, the individual and the autonomous pursuit of happiness goes in fact alongside with the democratization of society. These two uh, are in a sort of analogy. But what one expects as an outcome of this history is of course this autonomy to, to generate far more happiness than we used to face in former religious uh, systems or political collectivities. Um, why should we expect that? Well, since we could only be happy through what was told us, uh, what was told to us, or what was simply obligatory, it only seems fair and reasonable to presuppose that happy times have arrived mankind. So one could presuppose the less heteronomy uh, the more happy we would be. But as your analysis clearly has shown to us, the contrary seems the case, and this is rather contra-intuitive. Although we, we cannot deny that autonomy is central to our society, we seem to um, suffer from a new, a strange kind of heteronomy. Um, not a heteronomy in the common sense of the word, as something what overcomes us from outside from what I call a big other, church, a party, a god, society, uh, however you call it, but it's a sort of heteronomy from inside society, or even inside uh, from ourselves. And this is what I call myself in English, autonomy, from too old, not the autonomy, but autonomy. Um, because I think you're right with stating that today, uh, while, while we are autonomous beings, we, we ought to do a lot. And this is explicitly expressed in the um, imperative of our era. You have to be yourself, which is very paradoxical, of course, because the have expresses a sort of obligation, while to be yourself is, well, in fact, a synonym for um, 
no obligation uh, whatsoever. So um, um, I cannot escape today as um, an individual from the idea that I have to be myself and therefore I have to be happy, I have to be healthy, uh, I have to enjoy my life. And this is also why, why I'm, um, I must confess that I'm, I'm very uh, fond of women's magazines. I think this is obligatory literature for all philosophers too, because if, if you want to understand your time, read the women's magazines. They're, they're full of imperatives. There are times are, are, are really fully expressed. But then, given this, this fact, the question is, well, one of the questions could be, how to confront ourselves <coughs> with this intertwining, this going together of autonomy and heteronomy, and also how to find, because you really understood it as a problem, how to find some new, you could call it new cultural stances, uh, tools, to find a sort of new balance in our, in our hunt for um, happiness. But as your, as your analysis includes a very thorough, very fundamental cultural critique, at first hand, it seems to me almost impossible to escape from it. To escape from what you reveal, because it is such a fundamental tendency in current society. And uh, on top of that, it is rooted in historical evolutions, as you sketched us um, at, uh, tonight. So we're not talking about some, some fashion style, it's, it's a fundamental evolution. And therefore, I wonder how you would figure out the impact of your analysis. Um, as you detect the, the infinite tendency towards happiness in our culture, once we are involved in this desire for happiness, it appears to me we are simply struck into a sort of never-ending story, um, given the fact that we're all autonomous beings. And therefore, no counterweight seems heavy enough to find a new balance in, in this. And therefore, as, as you mentioned in your conclusion, if we live in a society which makes us unhappy in order to be happy, how about it? And, well, if I understood you well, and I, I guess I did, you understand this as something to regret, as something you try to change, but then of course, I think the difficulties have only started yet, but if we want to move away from what you call the, the religion of happiness, where to start, given the fact that our hunt for happiness is something we consciously do all the time? And this is, well, it's a rather basic question, but this is with a long preparation of my first <laughs> question. The, the, the second question is far more uh, small. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to respond right now or... Yeah? If not, I just keep on going, sorry. <laughs> well, yes, the answer was a new question, so yeah, yeah, that was uh, interesting, but I uh, want to make it very simple. I just, uh, what I try to study in this book, and uh, the way, uh, a wonderful idea which was formulated uh, by all uh, the philosophers and, uh, and uh, all the rebels the medieval times and the, and the Enlightenment time has turned into its contrary. So what I what I can blame is this quest for happiness. It's not happiness itself, but uh, looking to be happy makes us very unhappy. And uh, and it's a kind of new secular burden which lays on our shoulders and of which we cannot get rid of. We start by start by getting rid of religion, by getting rid of uh, taboos and. Uh, all those uh, uh, laws, we would be free to live our lives and in fact, it's a, as you say, a kind of new heteronomy which is uh, uh, coming back uh, on us, except that um, now there's a judge is not outside of us, it's inside our brain. We have the judge inside us and the, that's what the, the, some call the ideal of the self. We have uh, an idea of ourselves. We would like to be, we, we're not the person we would like to be. We would like to be someone better, someone uh, more fit, more intelligent, richer and brighter. And we constantly compare ourselves with this uh, ideal character, which we fail to, to, to become.
become most of the time. And, and if we make a comparison with the, the, the past centuries, our grandparents' ancestors, when uh, they um, when they arrived in, in adult life, just wanted to conform themselves to the life of their parents. And you know, they, what they wanted is they wanted just to adapt themselves to a tradition which made them farmers, miners, uh, judges, whatever uh, social position you had. So there was not this idea of inventing something new and today, when you have uh, kids, you, you, you don't want to transmit them values or ideas. What you want, you, you make kids to make them happy, which is also a terrible uh, commandment put on their shoulders. And, and uh, what can we say? They say, I, I'm not happy, what should I do? But uh, the, um, which is assumed in this uh, new ideology is that uh, from now on, you have every one of us, boy, girl, from wherever social milieu you, you come from, you have to invent your own life. And not only do you have to invent your life, but you have to succeed. You, have, you don't have the right to fail. If you fail, it's a total waste of, uh, of energy and then you, you get depressed. And this um, permanent self-invention of your uh, life is, of course, a huge weight on us. And that explains the anxiety of our society. We're not anxious because, not only because of the economic machine or because of the market, you know, that's a traditional Marxist explanation. That's partly true, but the main, main source of our anxiety comes from the fact that we know that we are only the only uh, responsible for our salvation on this earth, if I may say so, for our success, our failure. You know, we know that at the end of the life we will say, I had a wonderful life or I, I totally missed it, I, I failed it. And, in, and so we have put back the, on earth the judgment which was supposed to happen uh, in heaven, you know, for, for in the time of Christianity. Take, for instance, a very simple phrase which we hear every day. Uh, you meet a friend, or you meet some friend, and they say, Oh, you look gorgeous today. You look good. And then suddenly, you know, you, you're like a winner in the Olympic Games. Oh my God, do I look good? You must be so happy. That's a phrase you hear in the United States all the time. Oh my God, you must be so happy. That's wonderful. So suddenly you know, you're invested by, by, by uh, uh, incredible joy and uh, you're a winner. You, 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 you climb on the, on the podium and you know, you're number one. And two days after, one week after, you meet a good friend and say, my God, you look terrible, what happens? Are you, are you ill? And so you, you and then, then you, you fall back and on the wrong side. Uh, you finish, you have to go back, uh, you go back home and uh, try to, to uh, arrange your face and uh, to, 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 to have a better shape. And the simple words which you, you eat every day, uh, in fact, um, are exactly what uh, uh, the Calvinist, for instance, said, you know, you're, you're uh, an elect or you're rejected. And every day in our life, we do not know exactly on which uh, position we stand. Am I good? Am I bad? Uh, how do the others consider me? Who I am? Am I a loser? Am I still a winner? And you, on which side do I stand? And that's exactly the, the meaning of the, the question, how are you today? Which is a uh, uh, the, the metaphysic, metaphysical question by excellence. How are you today? How do I know what I, I should make a, a very fast evaluation of myself physically, mentally, morally? And, uh, and of course, we never answer. We say, I'm fine. But if you say, I'm not fine, people say, oh my God, what a pain in the ass I'm going to have to listen to his own. Uh, and it's embarrassing, yes. And um, so we have transferred all the religious categories, which were 
before collective and which were never um, definitive because you always have a way to redeem yourself. Those categories now uh, accompany uh, our everyday life. And, um, and that's a new burden, that, that's a counterpart of our freedom. We have gained freedom, we will never go back to the ancient time. No one of us could today live in villages as we used to live 100 years ago under the collective surveillance of the houses. No one of us could live in traditional society as exists, for instance, in Asia or in Africa or Muslim countries where you know, women have no freedom and men have to uh, obey their the family's commandments. But at the same time, we have to recognize that we pay the price of the emancipation which has been proclaimed during the Enlightenment. And this price sometimes is extremely high. Okay, thank you. Your, your example of, let's say, people meeting how are you reminded me of um, something the Slovenian philosopher Slava Žižek told once when he entered the States, he wasn't used to the fact that, of course, you don't answer the question, how are you, you just say, fine. But he answered it, and he kept on going, and he told the whole of his life to someone, and he realized, oh my God, this is really embarrassing, you should do that. It's, <laughs> it's not a question, it's, it's a code. Okay, um, then the, um, the second question, which, as I promised, is way shorter than the first one. Um, my second question deals with what I would call the stance of your analysis. Because I think it, it runs the, um, the risk, I'm not saying it does, but it runs the risk of falling back upon the very same logic it criticizes. And let me try to explain this very briefly. Um, if we start from the fact that the, let's say, the liberalization of man from the big other, um, this has led us towards a new religion, and this in fact, one could say, because the 60s have failed, in a way. Um, happiness can only, it seems, regain its comfortable place in society by liberating us from the idea that we have to liberate ourselves from all sorts of heteronomy in order to be happy. So it's a sort of double uh, negation. But then my question would be, which is, of course, very simple. Um, but how to, how to liberate oneself from a logic of, libera of liberation without falling back upon this very same logic? So by pleading to liberate ourselves from the current hunt for happiness and do, let's say, the opposite, don't you appeal to the very logic you are criticizing? That's my second question. Good test for a philosophy exam. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, I don't know what to answer, but no, I think the yeah, how to liberate ourselves from uh, liberation. Uh, I think we 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 do that every day to to, to survive. And uh, I would say that maybe the best way uh, not to be unhappy, not to be happy would be uh, not to give a damn about happiness, which means that we should accept it when it comes, uh, not try to retain it, uh, not try to focus on it, and uh, it's a kind of uh, hygienic uh, self-philosophy, uh, which is a way to escape uh, this uh, huge commandment, which in fact can never be satisfied because we're never happy enough and uh, as time goes by, we grow older, so we, we, we can fall sick, and then we disobey this uh, commandment to be happy, to be healthy, to be, uh, to be in a good shape, and uh, always to show a pleasant face to the others. And so, uh, the, the way to escape this uh, emancipation uh, duty would be, first of all, to accept the limits of our condition, that uh, distress, sadness, uh, light depression, moments of fear, moments of vacuum are not uh, abnormal, uh, 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 it's not an abnormality of uh, human condition, but on the contrary, uh, a normal moment of, uh, of 
everyday life and that most of our existence takes place uh, in a state of mind which is neither, neither happy or unhappy. But you know, we, we work, we, we, we live, we share pleasures with others, but in fact we're neither happy nor unhappy. It's, it's everyday life and then suddenly something happens, you know, something unexpected because happiness is always belongs to the order of the unexpected. A meeting with some with friends, a trip abroad, uh, uh, some good news which brings you a moment of joy and then suddenly you, you realize that you leave something which is above the normal uh, condition of everyday life. And uh, so maybe it's very simple but maybe this is the only way to escape this new dogma. Because which is extremely interesting is to see that this uh, wonderful idea of man's emancipation can also very often turn into its contrary. As you said, we are doomed to be free. We're doomed to be free, we're doomed to be happy, we have no way to escape it. And sometimes, we, we, we can say, or uh, well, most of the time, I don't care about my happiness. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it will come one day. But at least my only possibility is to welcome it when it, when it, when it arrives. And uh, uh, this uh, capability to, to uh, uh, recognize your happiness when it comes is probably, probably one of the greatest human gifts. Just if you allow me just a few more words. I always uh, quote this wonderful uh, story uh, written by Henry James. Uh, which is called The Peace in the Jungle. It's a, it's a story of a, it's a young lady takes place in Naples, Italy, at the end of the 19th century. It's a young lady, uh, she's in her 20s, and she's um, an English gentleman at the time, but it's a British, uh, invented, literally invented the, the French Riviera and the Italian Riviera, and invented the um, summer resorts. And, uh, this gentleman who is in his 40s tells this lady that uh, he has a, a special destiny because since he's a young uh, boy he is promised to a um, superior fate and he knows that one day uh, destiny will jump on it on him like uh, in the jungle the tiger jumps on the hunter and he says you know I, I have a very ordinary life. I get up in the morning, I look like every other citizen, but in myself I know I'm the elect. One day, uh, the fate will follow me and will save me forever. And this young lady is so surprised by what this man tells, him, tells her that she asks him the, the permission to remain on, uh, next to him. She says, yes, please do. You, you, you will see the change will come suddenly, and, and uh, the years the years pass. They go back to England, and she visits him every day, and nothing happens. And one day, this young lady uh, falls ill, and uh, she's going to die. And on, on a bed of uh, agony, she whispers something to this man. She says. To him, the beast has come, and you didn't see her. Said, well, what is she talking about? Uh, I know, I, I believe in my destiny. And then, is, then she, he buries her, and goes to visit her in the cemetery every day. And one day, he goes to the cemetery to pay his uh, duties to the lady who is not young anymore, and he's uh, getting gray hair. He's an old man now, and he sees a uh, one uh, a widower crying on the grave of his uh, dead wife and suddenly he understands what this young lady wanted to tell him that she was the one promised to him and that he missed her because he was not able to recognize love when it came and love was happiness and destiny and I think this is a wonderful uh, uh, short uh, story by Henry James and it tells a lot you know as most of the time, literature tells us things that we do not always understand. But uh, indeed, 
perspective, our only power on, on happiness uh, is to recognize it when it strikes us. If we let it go, if we think that this happiness is too small or too mediocre for us, and that we should uh, wait for the next one, which would be bigger, we would so we would certainly have a very miserable life. But I know I didn't answer your question, <laughs> but you did it in a very interesting way. <laughs> Good evening. I think that you said some very interesting things about how to deal with uh, happiness, the pursuit of happiness, but I have a couple of problems with uh, the total context of your talk. I mean, you uh, are talking a lot about 2,000 years of Christianity, um, about the French Revolution, about enlightenment, and I'm wondering, um, is this really that important? Because in the last couple of weeks, I learned here that um, we can only think about how to become happy when uh, we, how should I say it? Um, when we don't have to think about, are we gonna have food for tomorrow, you know? When we are rich, then we can think about how are we gonna get happy? And then I'm wondering, is it really that different uh, in comparison with people in the Middle Ages or in the Roman Empire who didn't have to think about that? I'm just saying, when the Euro crisis hits us tomorrow and everybody loses their jobs and the Euro isn't worth anything anymore, are we still being interested in books about how to get happy for dummies? Or isn't that of concern? That's my question. That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, I think well, first we should distinguish two things, which is uh, well-being and happiness. Well-being concerns precisely what you were speaking about. Uh, the fact that you, you, you eat every day what you want, that you have good social services, good health services, good transportation system, have, uh, good housing developments, and this is related to economics and, 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 and politics. And of course, uh, this can be uh, designed in statistics. And you can say, for instance, that for the moment in Western Europe, the morale of the people is extremely low because, as you say, the huge crisis is threatening us and might totally uh, erase the conquest of the last 50 years and make us much poorer than we are. And um, whereas happiness, of course, is, is something totally different. It's, it's a subjective feeling. So you can calculate the, the well-being of a people, especially when it's going down, as it is going down now. But in which concern happiness, you, you know, you can remain happy even in, in the middle of a, of a disaster. Because it, it's a subjective feeling, you can have moments of joy or moments of grace, um, even when the situation is, is not so good. But it's probable that this crisis, if it deepens and if it is getting worse, which should be the case, is going to a little bit uh, shaken our conception of happiness. And uh, I'm afraid that our main concern will become not how to be happy, but how not to be unhappy, how can, could we avoid uh, misery, uh, cuts in salary and, and things like this. So I think we will come back suddenly in extremely concrete issues which we have tendency to forget uh, in, in, in the Western world. Because of course happiness is a luxury of, uh, of uh, wealthy uh, nations. When, you, you know, when you're starving, when you have no uh, um, pipes to bring you water when you have a decent health system. Happiness is just a, a metaphysical consideration. And so suddenly we're brought back in Western Europe with a situation we saw was, was belonging to the old times. And uh, we're switching back backwards. And uh, backwards to the condition of our grandparents, you know, just before and after World War II. When well, life was extremely hard, we thought we had come out of this condition and now probably 
going to fall back into this. So this is extremely concerning. You say exactly that happiness is a concern of wealthy nations, but my question was, is it in our time, with the, the death of religion and the enlightenment, is it a different concern for us than a concern for the wealthy Romans 2,000 years ago? Because that is what you suggested, that by the end of Christianity and, and the end of and, and, and the French Revolution and the emancipation, that nowadays we as wealthy people, we should think different about happiness than, than the rich people in the Indian Empire 500 years ago. I don't think that that is that much different. I think that in the Roman Empire, the rich people also wanted to look good and, and went to the hairdresser and, and were happy with compliments and were unhappy when they were fat or so. Well, I, I, I don't know if they were unhappy to be fat. Uh, maybe we should, yes, maybe there were. Uh, there is a literature about that, but uh, uh, which has changed, and this is a major change, is that in the old times, people were doomed to the social condition. If you were born a slave, you, you, you had to remain a slave, and exceptionally, you could maybe um, change your status, but you know, it was uh, extremely complicated. If you were born a master, you would remain a master. If you were born a peasant, this would be your destiny, uh, and it was the destiny of your ch children. So the revolution brought by the Enlightenment in, 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 in Scotland, in, in Germany, in France, and in the United States is that um, philosophers and politicians proclaim something which is absolutely new in history. You're not doomed to your birth condition. That's exactly what the, the Enlightenment said. You were born a woman, you don't have to do only to bring up children and remain in the kitchen and be the, the servant of your husband. You can go to the university, you can have your own life. And uh, this is a uh, commandment, you're not doomed to your birth condition, you're not doomed to your social condition. is uh, the, the, the great motto of our Western societies. And this, uh, this motto is not, uh, not yet accepted by many other societies. For instance, Changing religion, as you know, in, in most Muslim societies, you don't have the right to change religion. And you don't have the right either not to be religious. Whether in, in, in Europe you can be born a Christian, if you're Catholic, you can convert yourself to Protestantism, you can convert yourself to Islam, or you can say, I don't believe in God and I don't care. I do my life as I wish. So I think the main change. Um, if you compare the situation nowadays with the one of the Roman Empire or the one of the Middle Ages, it's exactly this. Nowadays, we're supposed to be the masters of our life. It's a huge burden, but also it's worth doing it. Because who would accept to be to have uh, the terms of his existence dictated by his father, his mother, his family, by a tribe, by a religion, by a party? No one. So I mean, I think that is a uh, that, that, that's the most beautiful message which is still valid from the Enlightenment time. Okay, thank you. Perhaps a way to escape the dark one. Is it possible that depression and depression would disappear if I shift the focus from myself and I focus on the people around me? Should I repeat? Yes, maybe. <laughs> Can you turn to the public as well? Because I'm afraid they don't understand. My question is, is it possible that pressure of the dogma and depression would disappear if I shift the focus and I don't focus on myself any longer, but I look at the people around me and I share? Yes, to answer the question, no, I think it's not possible. I don't want to disappoint you, but... There is no society without uh, dogmas and commandments. As I said during the speech, um, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the, the, main, uh, the, the major psychological disease was neurosis. Uh, that I 
I said was an encounter between uh, our own personal desires and uh, the prohibition of society. Um, that's why Sigmund Freud wrote, uh, here is in civilization. Civilization always makes us discontent because we can never do whatever we want. And um, every social condition has its pathologies. And depression is a pathology of a time which believed in happiness more than in everything. And uh, so for this reason, so with, there is no positive uh, progress without a negative side. Uh, if there was no negative side, we would uh, live like angels in paradise. And we're not angels. So uh, the only thing we can do is to cure depression uh, by any kind of possible means that uh, we can, but uh, uh, an era without pressure and depression uh, is not conceivable as long as we remain human beings that is mortal, uh, doomed to, 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 to die in one day. Uh, as uh, Woody Allen said, life is short and then you die. And I think uh, nowadays life is longer, which is a huge conquest. We can, uh, we have gained about more than 10 or 20 years compared to our grandparents, which is a huge conquest. But even this conquest has its uh, counterparts. You know? And uh, so, no, if we want to be happy, we have to pay the price for it. There is a price to pay for every conquest, for every progress as a flip side. Votre exposé était très intéressant. Je voulais revenir sur la remarque que M. Devis a faite au début, que ça fait très bizarre de vous entendre parler en anglais. Je comprends, que, je suppose que c'est une politique générale de l'université, mais je trouve quand même que pour euh, quelqu'un qui parle de philosophie, c'est dommage de ne pas vous entendre parler dans votre langue maternelle. Et je veux... Et je reviens sur la question de la dame, de la dame avant moi, parce que je crois qu'elle n'a pas été bien comprise. Ou est-ce que... Je crois, crois qu'elle a demandé, est-ce que le, le fait de se fixer sur soi-même n'est pas un facteur qui euh, ne, ne, ne nous amène pas euh, le fait d'être heureux, mais au contraire, qu'on qu serait plus heureux si on ne se fixe pas sur soi-même, mais sur le bien d'autrui. So I can uh, answer in French, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my Finnish is extremely poor, I have to say. Uh, but uh, everyone speaks French? You're supposed to, but uh, no, in the state of Belgium today, it's not exactly the case. Oui, est-ce qu'effectivement, euh, il peut y avoir un bonheur dans le dévouement à l'autre Il est vrai que la, la, la conception contemporaine du bonheur peut aller de pair avec un narcissisme outrancier et un souci de soi qui peut altérer le souci d'autrui. C'est-à-dire qu'on est tellement angoissé par euh, sa propre image et par l'idéal qu'on s'est fixé qu'on oublie aussi que le Effectivement, la, la, majeure, la valeur de l'existence tient aussi dans, dans, dans l'engagement qu'on a vis-à-vis d'autrui et dans, le, dans les bienfaits que, que, que nous prodiguons aux autres. Donc finalement, les, le, un, un, un débat sur le bonheur devrait aussi euh, peut-être nous mener à un débat sur l'amour. Est-ce qu'au fond, le, le, le plus grand bonheur, ça n'est pas quand même d'aimer d'aimer les autres sans forcément chercher à être aimé en retour est-ce que ça n'est pas justement dans les liens avec autrui que réside, euh, euh, que réside la, la plus grande partie du bonheur Et on pourrait se demander si le misanthrope est heureux. Est-ce que le misanthrope est un être heureux Ou est-ce que c'est au contraire quelqu'un qui a renoncé à, la, à, la, à une grande source de félicité Mais je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir bien répondu à votre question. C'est-à-dire que passer en français tout d'un coup me fait, me fait bizarre. Ça va revenir très vite. C'est un peu comme Anna Ehrenberg ou Daniel Ehrenberg a appelé la fatigue d'être soi, 
Je pense que c'est vraiment le résumé de notre temps. La fatigue est d'être soi. Donc, oui, oui, la liaison entre l'individualisation et la dépression, disons l'augmentation de la dépression dans notre société. Donc, c'est ça ce qui s'appelle la fatigue est d'être soi. Et c'est une expression si typique française, donc on ne peut pas le traduire. Oui, c'est une expression que, que j'avais utilisée dans un livre aussi. Comment Ah, Ehrenberg. Daniel euh, Anna 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 Anna. Oui. Un sociologue français. Oui, oui c'est un français. Oui. Voltaire, dans son temps. Donc, ces propos qu'il tenait sur le bonheur, le paradis des humains, c'était nouveau. C'était nouveau. Dans son temps, ça a provoqué euh, un choc, ou ça a bouleversé les gens, ou éveillé ou réveillé. Ah ben, non seulement ça a provoqué un choc, mais le, le livre a été brûlé. Voltaire a dû plusieurs fois quitter euh, Paris parce qu'il était euh, condamné par euh, l'Église et par la monarchie. Donc le, le, les philosophes des Lumières, euh, où qu'ils soient, que ce soit en Allemagne, en, en, en Écosse ou en France, ont été des gens pourchassés, persécutés. Parce qu'effectivement, c'était une époque où affirmer la liberté humaine et le droit au plaisir, cest simplement le droit à, à jouir de la vie, euh, êtes-vous condamné à l'opprobre de l'Église C'est vrai qu'on a oublié ça, mais pour ceux qui ont reçu une éducation religieuse classique, ce qui est mon cas, dans une école catholique, on oublie à quel point, euh, dans l'enseignement de l'Église, la souffrance avait un rôle important. Souffrir, c'était se montrer un bon chrétien, c'était préparer une vie de croyant. Et le, le plaisir était toujours considéré avec suspicion. Euh, effectivement, quand Voltaire écrit cette phrase qui nous paraît aujourd'hui très simple, c'est une phrase qui a eu une très longue postérité. Parce qu'elle a été reprise par notamment un philosophe allemand qui s'appelle Ernst Bloch. Euh, elle a été reprise par Camus aussi, sous une forme ou sous une autre. Elle a été reprise par des penseurs romantiques. Euh, et c'est une phrase qui, évidemment, euh, détruit euh, en quelques mots toute la conception du paradis terrestre et du paradis céleste. Puisqu'au fond, le paradis, c'est là où on est, c'est aujourd'hui. La vie, c'est pas demain, c'est pas hier, c'est le moment que je vis dans l'instant. C'est tout de suite... Et ça, cela, cela rejoint le carpe diem des anciens, euh, le, le, la philosophie épicurienne. C'est-à-dire l'idée qu'au fond, dans, dans les, grandes, les trois grandes dimensions du temps, c'est le présent qui doit prévaloir dès lors que nous nous soucions de notre, de, de, de notre joie. Je vous was one paragraph I was a bit puzzled by. Um, you said that um, at least during Christianity, people had a reason to suffer. There was, there was meaning to suffering. And then it goes on, or you continue with, well, in a, secular, a secularized world, um, all meaning is lost when it comes to suffering. And I wondered why would that really be? I, why, would, why would that actually be? Why, why does, uh, why does suffering, suffering has no meaning anymore? Yeah. Yeah. In a sexualized world, yeah. I don't. Well, well, I think you imply that I do not agree of course. No, no. Yeah, yes, I understand. So I see there are three stages. The first one is a situation of uh, poor people in, 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 the mid, in the medieval ages and until. Uh, until the 18th and 19th century, and whenever those, those poor people, you know, had to, to go through a plague, through an epidemic, or uh, were starving uh, to death, the answer of the church, the answer of the authority was to say, this is God's will. God wants you to die. You lost your kids. Sorry, this is God's will. And uh, modernity has changed. Is, uh, this mentality by saying there is maybe God's will, but there is a man's power. 
and man has the power to improve his material conditions. And this went uh, along with uh, the industrial revolution, the improvement of agricultural system, and especially the improvement of medicine during the 19th and the 20th century. And especially since World War II, where we have made huge progress in, in, in uh, our capability to cure diseases. The third stage is the one we are living now, and which is extremely interesting. Is that, and it consists into this, the more we progress into our fight against fatal diseases, the more we fear those diseases. Which means that uh, the, the progress of medicine is going along with the progress of fear, which is the paradox of our modern times. And, um, and so, uh, this is also the paradox of progress. We have overcome so many Ill, Ill, illnesses. We have defeated so many sins. Why do we still die? Why do we still have fatal diseases? Uh, why do, do we still have uh, epidemics? And I think this is uh, so progress goes along with an allergy to evils. We do not, uh, we cannot stand anymore that we 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 can suffer. Uh, small uh, illnesses or that we we could have a fatal disease which will uh, take us away because you know we we thought that progress was uh, definitive and that we we should have reached a stage where this time all those evils of the ancient centuries are gone and that's exactly what we're living today uh, we have made a lot a lot of progresses but it's, it's never enough we want more, and it's a kind of uh, vicious circle. You know, it's uh, it would never be enough. Too much is not enough. We would like more, and um, so the, the 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 progressive conquest of happiness goes along with our uh, with an immense allergy to unhappiness. Unhappiness is and remains the main scandal for every one of us, especially when we lose someone we love. And because he, you know, the person dies of, uh, of, of a special disease, and um, and so you know, in, in a way, it's a progress uh, if you consider uh, the, the ancient uh, times. But in another way, we did not did not move on. Uh, we're still being scandalized about what is happening to us, who always ha is happening to the people we love. I don't know if I made myself clear. Right, again, my point was that. Um, I, I do not really believe that secularism is, is in itself meaningless, and you seem to imply that with that sentence, that um, suffering within a secular world is meaningless, and hence, why, why should that be? Why, why couldn't it have any meaning? And I'm loosely uh, thinking about uh, Richard Dawkins, who talks about secular world does have meaning. I mean, we can come up with, for instance, it could be a trick for creativity. That, that could constitute meaning. Yes, now I understand. Um, yeah, what has changed in comparison with the uh, old centuries is that uh, nowadays the meaning of suffering has to be constructed. So it has to be constructed on a collective plan. For instance, uh, think of those uh, uh, groups, cancer groups or uh, AIDS groups, which have uh, formated themselves when uh, in, inside the hospitals, inside the society, uh, where people try to find together a disease that can kill them, and by helping each other, they develop a solidarity and they give a meaning to their suffering. And. Uh, so, you know, in ancient times, the meaning was given by the tradition and by the religion, you know. You, you, you were going through a, a setback or hardship, and you knew that it, it, it had to be referred to God's will or to the Bible or to, uh, um, to the, the faith you were believing in. Nowadays, this meaning is not given anymore. Made, you have to construct him. And uh, 
There is an interesting uh, instance about that. It is a fact that most of the time we accept to suffer for a goal that we have set ourselves. For instance, uh, think of those navigators who will cross the Atlantic on a, on a small boat. Think of those uh, mountain climbers that uh, go through huge suffering because they want to reach the Mont Blanc or the Everest or some other things. So the only suffering I accept is the one I have defined myself. You know, I'm ready to work like a slave uh, 14, 18 hours a day in order to, to succeed my exam, or in order to, to write a book, or in order to, to, to make my own company. But what we do not accept, and what we, we never accept, is the pain that strikes you when you did not expect it. And to this pain you cannot give a meaning, you have to accept it, you have to suffer, maybe recover it, and, um, but this one is unbearable. And there will always be a part of, of modern suffering which will be meaningless. It's a simple fact that we grow old and that we will die one day. Death is the last, uh, the last ordeal that nobody will accept willingly. You know, we have no choice, unfortunately. So, uh, so maybe this, this is a difference. And this time I understand your question better than before. Oui, je voudrais vous euh, féliciter avec un discours très lucide. Euh, J'ai suivi tout le temps sans jamais avoir euh, l'impression qu'il y avait une, une, euh, une, une, un fait qui était au moins de table. Euh, mais je voudrais me. Euh, I would like to uh, confirm a little what the last gentleman has said, uh, that after all there is uh, a fault with the reasoning, I think, or at least a blind spot that you have not covered. Uh, when I, I had made, made a drawing here, uh, there is a balance between is pain... Is it short? It's short. Uh, there is a balance between four things. Happiness, pain, uh, fear, uh, uh, there was something else, uh, wellness, which you said is something different. There is a balance there. Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly, you have uh, talked about the influence of religion all the time, on that balance. Influences of politics has been talked about. But I think what the gentleman mentions that there is a third area which maybe has played a bigger role in all of this, that is science. Okay. We do have, since the time of the Enlightenment, we have experimental science. And the Enlightenment were often experimental scientists. Yeah, I think the only uh, obscene word of, the, of our modern uh, time is incurable. You know, the only thing we do not accept is that some diseases uh, cannot be cured, you know, that we, we have to succumb to the uh, uh, eruption in our lives. And uh, in spite of the fact that, of the fact that science is growing very fast and it's making miracles, those miracles are never enough for us. So, um, I don't know if I answered your question uh, once again. Yes, you want to the, the major thing is we, we can no longer think destiny today. And that's also what the first question was about, I guess. When some pain or suffering overcomes me in the 14th century, I think it is a punishment of God which I should go along with. But today, if I'm suffering, I'm not thinking about the punishment of God, I think uh, destiny has fallen on me and I can no longer accept destiny because I want to fight against destiny. That's what modernity is all about. It's not the acceptance of life as it is, it's the modification of life as I want it to be. And that's the huge difference between a the theological worldview and a modern one. And that's why we, we, can't, we can no longer deal with, with destiny 
there's always someone which should be to blame. If I'm sick, if I'm not happy, there is some cause, we think. And that's why we keep on looking for causes and then someone to blame that my happiness hasn't achieved. So I think that that's a huge point. We, we have some difficulties with destiny today concerning our health and our happiness. But, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very good. And uh, no, because I was thinking of writing a book about destiny. So, so what you said, it just opened a huge door. But uh, you're totally right. And I'm going to repeat uh, what you just said. I said the, the modern man is, is someone who is repelled against his condition. And um, it's, a, it's a constant rebellion to our last breath. And as you said, and you were perfectly right, when we are ill, when we are defeated, when we get poor, we're looking for someone responsible. I suffer, someone must be the cause for that. And that is why the modern times are developing in their ways a new uh, theory of scapegoats. We, we every day accuse a lot of scapegoats of our own miserable conditions. And uh, we need that in order to survive. Because if the scapegoat, if they are only responsible for our own miserable conditions in ourselves, this is unbearable. So there is a strange conflict between uh, uh, this will to overcome our, um, uh, our uh, unhappiness and this tendency to point at someone or some institution and say this is his fault. A very, very, very last, last remark. <laughs> What's the difference with God as a scapegoat then? Excuse me? What's the difference with God, with the difference with God as a scapegoat? The difference so the religion was not just another construction. But you got on the scapegoat? Yeah, well, uh, this is no, in, in the old times it was his fault. No, 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 yes. No, it was his will, which was quite different, you know. And uh, God was supposed to contain an, an infinity of wisdom. So if he punished you now, it was to reward you afterwards. You know, you were going to die uh, when you recatished the that's what it says, you know. So the, the last one on earth will be the first in heaven. Of course, no one never came back from paradise to tell you that it was worth a trip. Uh, and so uh, we will never know until we die. But, uh, you know, God was the absolute judge. And today we point at scapegoats to destroy them because we think that it's their fault. It can be the society's fault. Capitalism, for you know, you can point out many, many things, and so um, and so we want to destroy the scapegoats in order to feel better.